Amen. Join me now, if you would, and turn over to 1 Timothy. So as we came out of the Christmas season, we were looking in Isaiah, and we're going to spend the next few weeks considering worship. And not just worship in song, but corporate worship, what we're doing right now, namely Sundays from 9 a.m. to... You know, whatever that ends, 10:15. I guess the, the preaching guy should know when it's supposed to end, but that doesn't give you much hope. We're going to end early, does it? <laughs> Nevertheless, we're going to be talking about corporate worship, what we do as a church when we gather together and why we do what we do. Because as adults, I'd say, especially as parents, uh, we might presume that, you know, we're starting to get this whole life thing figured out. You know, we've, we've learned a thing or two over the years or so, we thought. You know, we've been through school. We've been through the school of life. We've been through the school of hard knocks. We've learned some lessons, hopefully, after some time. And, and so you might think you begin to know a thing or two, but then you have a child, or you simply hang around that inquisitive young person, and you encounter that three three-letter question that just exposes you for the ignoramus that you really are. And it's that question, why? Why? That small question just exposes all that you have forgotten and you're supposed to still know. Why is the sky blue, Daddy? Well, I think it has something to do with like sunlight bouncing off water molecules in the air or, oh, I just don't remember, honey. Why do we say oxen instead of oxes? Why not say boxen instead of boxes? I have no idea. I don't know. Why do we have a spleen? I don't even know what a spleen is, honey. So then I just start dropping in that brilliant response. That's just the way it is. It just is this way. Now, many Christians, I think even pastors, sadly, may share similar dumbfounded expressions when asked, why does the church do certain things in corporate worship? Why is the sermon so long? Why do we pray in church? Why do we stand then? Why do we sit at that point? Why do we sing those songs? And especially for those of us that have grown up in church, or if you've been in church now a long time, we're just tempted to say to those questions, well, it just is. That's just the way it is. That's the way it has been. That's the way it will be until Jesus comes back, I think. Now, church tradition has value. But our worship gatherings ought to be more intentional than this. Namely because God's Word, even then in the New Testament, speaks to how we should fill our corporate worship times together. That is, evidently God has given thought to this. He cares about this. What we do and how we spend our time in worship together... And he wants us to consider this seriously, too. That's why he's given us in his word, after all. Given us these, these truths we're going to be studying. The word of God drives our worship. And as what we find is that it centers, then, our worship all around Jesus Christ and the gospel. Such to say that our corporate worship, it's driven by God's word. We read the Bible. We preach the Bible. We sing the Bible. We pray the Bible, and then we see the Bible in corporate worship, or see the gospel. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Over the next few weeks, these are the truths that we're going to unpack over most of January. We're going to ground these truths about why our worship together is word-driven and gospel-centered. Why we read the Bible, preach the Bible, sing the Bible, pray the Bible, and see the Bible or the gospel in the ordinances. We're going to ground these truths to explain why. Why do we do what we do? And to consider how we can, as, as a congregation, more faithfully do this. Now, specifically this morning, we're turning to First and Second Timothy. These books, they serve as something like a guidebook or an instruction manual for the church. The Apostle Paul wrote these letters to Timothy. He was the acting pastor of the Ephesian church. Specifically for this purpose, why did he write? He wanted to direct the church. Give them a, a guide to go by. So 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. You can even glance at that now. Here's what Paul says. Here, he's telling Timothy why he's writing. 1 Timothy 3, 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that... So he hopes to get there, but in the meantime, I'm going to write to you so that if I delay, you may know how. One ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. So what does Paul say? 
how should the church behave, so to speak? How should we live in God's house? How then shall we worship? Well, the first thing where we're going to study this morning, we see that the Word drives us to read the Bible and to preach the Bible. So to summarize then, you see the statement behind me. As we gather for corporate worship, we must read the Bible and preach the Bible. Why are we given to these things? So as to obey God's Word. We're going to find it's commanded to us. We find, too, that this is how believers are trained up to become more like Christ. And finally, this is the way He is ordained to lift up the gospel of Jesus Christ through Scripture-driven, gospel-centered ministry. The outline's pretty simple. It's going to unfold this way, looking at various texts from First and Second Timothy. And first, we're going to see what our task is. Our task is this. We must read, preach, and teach. No surprise, but this is going to be dominating, particularly through the letters. Also, that's our task, but then what's our text? What do we read and preach and teach? What we find is that it's, no surprise, it's the Scripture. And then find if we're doing that faithfully, our text and our teaching should have a certain theme, our topic. We must preach and teach the gospel of Christ. So let's look first at our task. We must read, preach, and teach. So as one surveys the various commands that are in First and Second Timothy here, our task as the gathered church becomes rather clear. Our task is to read, preach, and teach. So given the importance of church life then, if, that, if that's true, I, I don't think it surprises you as you read through First and Second Timothy to see that the leaders of the church then are primarily what? What do they primarily do? The elders. They teach. This is what elders do. Among the many qualifications, so as you just glance there still at 1 Timothy 3, one aspect in particular stands out. That is, many of the qualifications for an elder are mainly character-driven, save one. One has a skill, and namely it's to be able to teach. That is, the elders, they must first be exemplary, experienced Christian men. But if you see the end of verse 2 of chapter 3, what must his skill be? He must be able to teach. That is, he's not only able to live the Christian life, but he has to have this skill of necessarily, he must have this skill and this aptitude and ability to make it clear. That is, the Scripture. So it shouldn't surprise then to see that Paul revisits this command and this idea repeatedly in this text. So look over with me at 1 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verse 11. He just starts off and he says, Here, command and teach these things, Timothy. Be a teacher. Now we're going to come back and revisit what is the what that he teaches, but simply just notice that command, teach these things. And this isn't a suggestion from the apostle. This is not an option among many things that a pastor might do or that the church gathered might do together. Rather, this is a command from an apostle, ultimately from God, teach. You know, this isn't something the church just might want to do if we can get around to it. This is a command. This is an imperative. It's a rule for the pastor's ministry in the church's life. We must preach. God commands us to. And it's coupled, this command to teach. You see the first command there, actually verse 11, skipped over it, but you see it there now. He teaches with authority. Command. That, that's the actual command he gives. Command and teach these things. This reveals something of the nature of teaching, doesn't it? Even this teaching, it's not a you can take it or leave it if it suits you type thing, is it? These aren't suggestions. The teaching itself, as we find, is inherently authoritative. It bears weight. It demands response. This is the role of the church in preaching. And that explains Paul's next word to Timothy there, to young Timothy. Look at verse 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, Timothy, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. So young Timothy at this time, he was probably in his late 30s. 
And it appears that Timothy was being ignored by the congregation because of his inexperience in life. Particularly think of this ancient Near Eastern setting where the elders literally were the oldest people, the most experienced typically in the tribe or the village, etc. But that Timothy was being ignored, this was not acceptable to the Apostle Paul or to God. They should not dismiss his teaching, and not because of who Timothy is inherently, but because he teaches by the authority and the call of God. He teaches with authority. He's been commissioned to do it. Because understand, the church was built on always the teaching and doctrine of the apostles. Remember the church began in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came and indwelt God's people. And it comes with that Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. But you remember towards the end of chapter 2, we find what the early church is doing as they gather together. You remember? Let me remind you, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, reads this way. And they, so this newly founded church, they devoted themselves. But what first? First, does it list? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to apostles' teaching, fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. We talk a lot about all of those things in the coming weeks. But first, it lists they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, their doctrine. And that's the way it's always been for the true church ever since to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. That's what the church is to be about. Okay, well, what does that look like in Timothy's case then, or in our own case, when you don't have an apostle just at hand? What do you do? Well, verse 13, look. 1 Timothy 4.13 Until I come, until the apostle arrives, what are you supposed to do? Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. He tells Timothy to devote himself to this. Give a close attention to these things. Be set on them. Keep your focus ever directing and pointing the church to the doctrine, to the teaching, to the Scripture. Namely, first he lists there what things are they to be devoted to. The first thing he mentions is to quote the public reading of Scripture. Now, literally, just more simplistically, you might even notice this in the New American Standard translation. It just says to read, devote yourself to reading. But understand, reading back then in a private context was even typically allowed. People didn't read in their heads. That was a strange thing to them. But no doubt, Paul here is talking about reading as in public worship or corporate worship. The same word reading is used precisely in that way in Acts chapter 13, verse 15, when it talks about the reading of the law and the prophets in the synagogue service. Or Jesus himself read, same word, the scripture, publicly in the worship service, the synagogue service of Luke chapter 4. So understand then. At Grace Bible Church, we don't simply read the Scripture aloud because we find it convenient in preparation to hear the sermon. We don't merely read the Scripture aloud that it, as it is, with no comment, just naked before us. We don't do that simply to just take up time or because we think it's a helpful learning exercise to prepare for our study. No, we read the Scripture because it's commanded to us. Clearly here, devote yourself, devote yourself, set your mind, direction to the public reading of Scripture. We do well not to crowd this out of the service, lest we crowd out God's very voice himself. Now the pastor doesn't only bear the responsibility to read, but to exhort and to apply that word to God's people, that is to teach. Because notice, as you just glance here here at the end of chapter 4, you just see the proliferation of commands that are all underscoring the importance of reading and teaching for the worship and life of the church. Look at verse 14. Timothy, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Timothy, you've been gifted for this task. You've been equipped by God specifically to do this. Be faithful. Fulfill your ministry. So then the matter of public reading of Scripture and teaching, they demand Timothy's hard and fast attention, direction, attention. Verse 15, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. 
This is how Timothy is going to be a faithful minister of the gospel and to God and how the church is going to then live and thrive. It's by him practicing, being devoted, focused to these things. And I don't think Paul could then highlight the importance of reading the scripture and teaching and doctrine any more than he could if you go down to verse 16. Look there. Verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself, okay, and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. So notice the two commands he gives here. Again, directing Timothy's attention and focus. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Guard yourself. Be trained in godliness. Earlier he mentions this from the scripture we read. Keep a close watch on these things, on the doctrine. Persist in them. May this be your focus. Orient yourself to this purpose of reading the scripture and teaching and, and don't divert from the path. Put the hammer down and follow it through. This is the calling for the church. Persist in this. And as you keep reading there in verse 16, you see why. What's at stake? Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this for, so here's the ground, here's the reason. By so doing... You will save both yourself and your hearers. Now for an evangelical Protestant church, that should blow our minds. Consider what hangs in the balance, so to speak, as the pastor gives attention to his life and to the preaching of the word and the ministry. Well, what hangs in the balance? For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. <laughs> Now, don't overread that, okay? I, nor any pastor or elder or Bible teacher, could possibly save someone. Let's be clear. Now, even glance up back with your eyes to verse 10. Look at verse 10 of this chapter. God is the only Savior of mankind, right? We have set our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Pastors are not priests. They're not, we're not mediators or saviors. And I don't think in verse 10, Paul forgot what he had said by the time he got to verse 16. He didn't lose his mind. So what's he talking about? What does he mean? Paul's underscoring for Timothy how crucial by God's design, by God's plan, is the preaching and teaching for the salvation of souls. God has determined, this is the way God does it. This is the way he said, I'm going to do this, trust me and follow through. God has determined to save people through preaching, through teaching, through the heralding of the gospel of Christ. Understand then, when the church abandons this, neglects this, or undermines this, you have then undermined the principal means God has determined to use to save sinners. You've taken this gift for God's people that ensures they will persevere in faith until that glorious day, and you've taken it out of the church. As much as it depends upon us as a church and as elders for the salvation of souls, we cannot neglect the teaching, the preaching, and the reading of the Word of God. Too much is at stake. When I went to seminary, there hung in the halls of the library this saying, we train men as if lives depended on it. And this is powerful because as rightly understood, it's not simply as if souls depended on it, is it? No, because according to verse 16, they do. My professors understood that the mission of the church, the salvation of souls, rests in some measure that your pastors and the church together faithfully preaches and teaches and reads the word of God. We only neglect this duty to the peril of men's and women's eternal souls. Too much is at stake. What's our task? To read, preach, and teach. But what is our text? What do we read and preach? We read and preach the Bible. Turn now over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
This takes us to this next and most crucial aspect of our mission and as our duty as a gathered church. We're not simply to be given over to teaching and education just for its own sake, like some community center. That is, we're not out to teach whatever we might find to be helpful. We've been given a text. We've been given content. This is what we must teach, and it's the Bible, the Scriptures, the Word of God. Look here at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because we find first what the Scriptures are. We're reminded what we're handling when we're handling the Scriptures, and what are they? They are God's very words. Why are we given over to teaching the Bible? Because it's the very Word of God, verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Now, the traditional rendering here is all Scripture is inspired by God, and that's fine, as long as you understand what the word inspired here means. We're not talking about the kind of inspiration you feel, say, when you see a glorious sunset, and maybe you, wanna, you, you feel inspired to write a poem or sing a song about it. That's, that's not what inspired means here. The ESV that I was just reading breaks down that original word here, that word inspiration, more literally, translating it breathed out by God. That's what inspiration is. That is, the Scripture comes to us as if right from God's mouth. Every one of them. I mean, reflect on whose church this is, after all. It's Christ. It's our God who bought this church with His blood. And so then it follows that the Lord and owner of the church, that His voice, His word should be preeminent, should reign, should have our focus unhindered, undivided, undistracted, look towards the words that came from His mouth, the very words of God. Understand, we let Christ rule in His church, have greatest influence and authority in His church, the more we give ourselves to the preaching and teaching of the Scripture. That's how it works. This is what we must teach and preach. This not only makes logical sense, but it most directly benefits us too, just so we keep reading there. In verse 16, we find there's nothing more worth teaching or hearing. Because notice what this inscripturated word is good for. All Scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This word, this word is given for your direct benefit, for your profit, for your good. And in a multitude of ways. You see there, verse 16, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. You see then that God's Word is our subject. It's our assigned textbook for teaching. Because God's Word is God's provided means for your reproof. It's the mechanism He's given for your correction to straighten you out, to train you, to discipline you, to grow you up into Christ's likeness. It comes by this means of His Word. The Bible. That's how God intends to accomplish that in your life. Not through great Christian books, as helpful as those might be. It doesn't come through, namely, some great conference you went to and the worship songs you heard simply. It doesn't come from having some special secluded time with just you and God. God's Word is the principal means of your spiritual growth, especially by way of corporate worship, not even simply personal. Because understand, when Paul wrote these things, believers didn't commonly have a, a Bible in their homes. You know, the typical Joe Christian, he would encounter God's Word chiefly, if not exclusively, in corporate worship. Now, we can comment on the embarrassment of riches we have today, and praise God for them, with our unhindered access to God's Word. I mean, you have this treasure in your laps or on your phones in English, for one. But that, didn't, that, that came at a great cost of men and women giving their lives to pass on God's Word to you. So it's the new year. We come to that exhortation. Do not neglect how vital a regular diet of God's Word is for your spiritual growth. 
for your spiritual health and sustenance. Nevertheless, put that aside for a second, Paul's talking about corporate worship. By missing corporate worship, the collective intake of God's word, you're depriving yourself of one of the primary means he has designed to grow you up into Christ-likeness. One of the main ways he has ordained to change you, to work in your heart, to joyfully conform you to Christ. And God's word, as we see, as you keep reading here, it's most sufficient for this task, for achieving this. Look at verse 17. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's word works in your life to make you complete in Christ. Perfectly suited for any work, any ministry, any trial, any trouble that comes into your life. God's word is the most adequate and sufficient means to get you ready for this. So that any good work of ministry, good work of compassion, good work of fighting sin, of fighting lust, fighting anger or greed or anything else, you're made perfect for that by the word of God. Again, if, if that's the case, what are we to do as the church with this word? Well, Paul makes it very clear as you just keep reading on into chapter 4. We must tenaciously preach this word. Chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom, do what? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Repuve, re reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. What is our mission if it's not to preach the word of God? To herald God's very words. The power, the saving power, and the sanctifying power found in that sufficient, fully sufficient word of God if we're not feeding ourselves on this if we're not giving out the, this to the world what are we feeding on and what are we giving out what positive thinking health and wealth higher esteem encouraging stories motivational talks we're giving them a place to belong or well, whatever you make of any of those things if we're not giving out, preaching, and teaching God's Word, what are we giving people? Well, this much is clear. We're depriving them of God's Word. We're giving them a Word in the end that cannot save, and we're giving them a teaching that, that cannot sanctify, that's impotent to work change in their hearts. God's Word alone is given to work that. We must preach the Word. And such a tenacious commitment is needed for this task, whether it's seasonable, accepted, attracting a crowd, or whether it's not. We must preach the undiluted Word of God. When we, let alone the world, wants to hear it, or whether we or the world doesn't. That's why we must teach and preach it with patience toward our families, in our homes, especially in our churches. We must plod day by day, patiently teaching and preaching the Word of God, never moving from this task. Again, whether it draws people in and it attracts them, or whether it pushes people out. Now, why is that? He goes on. He says, because God's truth is not determined by a popularity contest. Look at verse 3. For the time's coming when people, they will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Your heart is a terrible arbitrator for what's good and true and helpful for you. Rather, we find people will flock into church buildings or inviting speakers into their churches or into their gatherings who simply tell them what they want to hear. Instead of what God says and what they actually need, which is what God says. And this could be no more plain in our day with so many churches. Whole denominations capitulating on matters of sexual matters, of gender issues, of men's and women's roles. Why are these groups advocating a different view divergent from the historic church for the past 2,000 years? Why are these teachings suddenly so novel in the church? Because cultural pressures 
appeal more strongly to them than God's Word in their minds in those cases. But our calling, as Paul calls Timothy here, must be to buck the trend, to be different, to be faithful, to, blot, to plod and persevere in laying out the Word of God for any and all who will hear. Verse 5. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, but here it is, fulfill your ministry. The pastor who does this, the church that fosters and encourages this, that's a faithful church that's going to fulfill its God-given task and ministry. The church that in season and out of season preaches and teaches the Word of God. May that be us more and more in 2019. That's our text. What's our task? It's to teach and preach. What's our text? We teach and preach the Bible. But for doing it right, that means we have a certain topic. We preach and teach the gospel of Christ. That is, faithfulness to this task to preach the Bible cannot merely, cannot merely be judged simplistically saying, well, well what book are they teaching out of? That is, if, that's the lo if that alone is the test of faithfulness to this task, understand a whole host of non-Christian groups pass the test. Right? Think about Orthodox Jewish synagogues. They tenaciously read and teach at least the Old Testament. Many cultists, especially when they come to your door, right? They are infatuated with teaching and the Bible. And even, note this, many legalistic churches and movements proudly wave the banner, we are Bible-centered. We buck the culture. We fight the trends. We're faithful, and, and so we're wildly unpopular. As if that's a badge. The point is, all those groups may hold up a Bible and say how important it is. They may base all of their lessons, all of their talks in the Bible, but they are evidently less than faithful to the church's task. And I note this because this might be particularly eye-opening for us who are at Grace Bible Church, right? Because we put such a premium on Bible teaching from stem to stern of the ministry of this church. Well, the point is, is that we can be all about right worship, we can be all about right teaching, and you can still miss it, even when you teach the Bible. Well, how do we know if we've missed it? How do we know if our Bible teaching is right? How can we assess whether or not we are rightly dividing the word, or have we simply become self-righteous, religious, biblicists? Well, here's the litmus test. What is the topic? What's the theme? What's the melody that's always heard in your worship? What is the theme that is always apparent in your handling of Scripture? Because what Paul teaches here is that Scripture has a theme. It has a mantra. It has a tune. It has a color that infiltrates every page. In other words, if our preaching and teaching of the Word of God fails to hit this theme, then we've missed it. We've failed to rightly handle the Word. Well, what is that theme? Well, just bump your eyes back up to the end of chapter 3. Right before the passage we started with, look at chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Now we know from the first chapter of 2 Timothy that both Timothy's mother and grandmother were believers who faithfully taught him and raised him up in the faith. Well, how did they do that? How did they raise him up in the faith? Look at verse 15. And how from childhood, Timothy, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. They trained him up. They acquainted him. They brought him to know the sacred writings, the Holy Scriptures. Okay, check. We're getting the Scripture out. Good. This is good, right? Well, sure. But not just that. The Scripture must be rightly applied, rightly understood and interpreted. And if you do that, what theme, what, what note is going to come out? Well, this is what he tells us. 
as he further describes these sacred writings, rightly understood. Here it is, 2 Timothy 3.15. The sacred writings, and then how does he describe them? Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What are the sacred writings all about? They give you knowledge. They make you wise. Unto what ends or what message? What do they clue you in on? To make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now again, reflect on this for a moment with me. What sacred writings is Paul talking about specifically? What were the writings that Timothy grew up with that his grandmother and his mother taught him as he was a child? Timothy would have been about 10 years old when Jesus was crucified. Timothy was about 20 years old, grown up in that sense, by the time even the first book, probably James in the New Testament, was written. So what's the point? Those sacred writings that Timothy grew up on, these weren't the New Testament books and letters, were they? What were they? The Old Testament law and prophets. What did Timothy learn in the Old Testament? What should he have seen? Well, he should have been made wise for salvation. Okay, yes. But not just wise for any old salvation. Notice what kind of salvation even the Old Testament leads us into when rightly understood. To make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what the Old Testament is about. I don't even need to say what the New is about. That's because the whole Bible is about this glorious theme that Jesus came to save sinners by grace through faith to the glory of God. That's, that's it from stem to stern, the whole Bible. That God is glorious. And he is merciful and gracious to sinners who look for mercy at the feet of the Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for them and is risen. The Bible from cover to cover is all about this glorious theme. So if our expositions, our Sunday school teachings to children, our sermons, our, our family devotions... Our readings of the Bible, if they fail to bring out this message, then apparently, according to Paul, we have failed to rightly divide the word of truth, the Bible. And understand, Jesus and the grace of the gospel, these are not themes that get read into Bible texts, you know, as if we can just pretend Jesus and the gospel are there when they're actually not. No, what Paul's getting at here is when you see the Scripture aright, you don't read Jesus and the Gospel in. Right? They understood you'd bring the Gospel out. You see the wisdom that makes us wise for salvation through faith in Christ. That's what the whole Bible's about. What's the Bible story from cover to cover? God is a glorious and good creator. And we are evil sinners who have spurned His love and His goodness over and over. If you started a Bible reading plan in Genesis, or you remember back to our preaching, you're seeing that up close and personal. And yet, despite all of our wickedness, despite all of our moral and spiritual weakness, God alone by His power saves, and saves by faith in His promise. Not His work, not our works, not what we do, not our reformations, but what He has done. And He says, trust me. I've done the work now through the sacrifice of my son. Trust me. That's where salvation is found. This is what the word of God makes us wise to understand. This is the word that we tenaciously preach, that we labor to make clear. The gospel of grace through Jesus' death and resurrection. So let that be heard even now. Rescue from our sin and its consequences doesn't come by a special Bible method. Doesn't come by going to a church that pre preaches expositionally. It doesn't come by reading through the Bible this year. Salvation comes by faith in Christ as the fully sufficient Savior. Romans 10, 14. And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And so we must preach. We must teach. We must read that word that makes us so wise for salvation that brings us to despair of ourselves but find a fully sufficient Savior in Jesus Christ.
And what we see, too, is that this gospel word of salvation, it's not just for the believing, or excuse me, not just for the unbelieving, the unbeliever. That's not who the gospel is simply for. But it's that same word, right? Think of the context of 2 Timothy 3. It's that same word, that same God-breathed word that trains us, too, believers, and equips us, that same gospel word equips us for whatever work, act, feeling that he has called us to follow through on. In other words, this gospel word of Christ is our life. From the beginning of salvation to the end of our sanctification when we see Jesus face to face. We cannot neglect in the least the word's prominence in our lives, let alone in our worship together. We must preach and teach the word of God, ever pointing to the good news in Jesus Christ. But with overflowing thanks to God, the reading and the teaching of the Word are not the only way to get this message before our, before our ears and before our eyes and before our hearts. In the coming weeks, we're going to speak more to this. But suffice it to say now, the Lord's table is another way that God gives us to meditate on the Gospel. This very act of partaking together, what are we doing? We are proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes. As we partake together, we affirm and we announce the central message of all of Scripture is that Jesus alone is our sacrifice and our Savior. Let's remember this as we come to the table. I'm going to pray now. I'm going to ask the men who are here to distribute the elements to come forward as I pray. Let's pray.